Uh, let's uh, call the meeting to order. It's the um, Board of Public Works meeting for October 8th, 2014. And the first item of business is public comment. And I believe we do have a... Yep. yep. I'm Harriet Brickman. I'm at 53 Bottoms Road. And my husband, Tom Reardon, and I have each had conversations with uh, Ned recently, who informed us that the current thinking about making Bottoms Road a public way was to bring it up to where our fields opened up. Our assumption had been that we would go to the house site and utilize the turnaround that we were doing for that purpose. If that's not your current thinking, then it needn't come up as far as our fields and we wouldn't want uh, a, turn a second turnaround carved out of our, our field. Um, there's a larger and, and important question that has to be answered and publicly documented. And that is, if as Ned has explained to us, to make Bottoms Road a, a public way, you take an easement across our property. Does that or does that not confer frontage on the adjoining properties, none of which currently have frontage? Um, that's potentially an issue of, of serious consequences. So I, I understand that these are, these are legal questions, and you'll probably run them by the, the city solicitor. Um, I'm just here to ask that you keep us informed of how the deliberations as they go on. Mm -hmm. so, is there a mechanism where, where we can? Because I've been getting bits and pieces of information from the surveyors. Or, you know, how you can get in touch with me? I can contact you when anything comes up. Okay. I do email address and phone number. Okay. But in theory, we just listened to the comment and thank people for their thoughts. but. It would be a public street, right? I mean, it would be frontage on the city street Well, is for it anyone who abuts Not it. if it's just an easement. Just, I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm not oh, it's a city street. It's a city street. Right. The question is, does it create frontage for house lots when you create an easement? Right. Versus most of the city streets that we're taking, we're taking in, not in fee, but basically we own the roadway itself, like new subdivisions. We own the road, the city owns the roadway. I think there's no distinction. I mean, th that's my impression from talking to the city solicitor. It's a street. Uh, in the past, occasionally, items have come up where we've, we thought we were going to sell to a building owner a chunk of sidewalk, for example. And we were thinking among ourselves, how much should we charge? And finally, Ed Etheridge pounded it through our head, that no, 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 you do not own the sidewalk. You have an easement over that part of this person's property. Mm -hmm. If you no longer need the sidewalk, you release the easement. Mm -hmm. But it's a taking for the public good, you know, as the lawyers would describe it. I mean, I maybe we need to explore yep. that before your street goes too much further, because mm -hmm. yeah. my understanding is it's a street. And if, you, if someone owns property on the street, they can do whatever they want as long as they meet the zoning criteria. Well, it's a it's, it's a question that needs to be answered, and I, I don't think that we we've, we've combed through everything to to find an answer to that, but I, we haven't found it yet. So it's it's going to need to be clarified one way or another, and people are going to need to know because it it will definitely change the neighborhood. There are there are as as we understand it, eight eight potential lots there, but south of us. You know, yeah. that, 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 south of one feels. <coughs> so. This hasn't moved forward, has it? Just in survey work right now. Yeah. And it, it, that was the, part, the street that was stalled, and we didn't um, we didn't say yes to it. And then there was a petition mm -hmm. by somebody mm -hmm. to do that after we did. Remember, we went back and we visited all of them. Is this one of the ones that we went and we visited? Yeah, yeah. 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 that's right. Because yeah. originally we had said no. Right. And then after our full review, it was similar to some other streets that we had mm -hmm. said yes to. So we went back and said, no, we'll move forward. Interesting question. Okay. That's Thanks. Yep, thank you. So we can right. yeah. pursue that a little bit, perhaps? Yeah. Okay. I was written down. Okay. Right. <coughs> um, okay. And I understand that the... We're not going to discuss the minutes of this, uh, tonight's meeting? We are not. Okay. So, could I have a motion to take, oh, it's next to that item, the Red Pine Report, discussion and contract approval. 
for the implementation of red pine salvage operations and interfering vegetation control. Move and that would be paid for by the Water Enterprise Fund. Second. Second. So we have uh, uh, Nicole and Mike here to talk to us a little bit about um, red pine. Mike has a contract, which is item number two, up for board review and, and uh, consideration for approval tonight. Um, we had talked uh, a few board meetings ago about um, issues with mortality of red pine because of uh, um, different things that were sort of attacking it. And since the thing that's changed, that sort of changes our schedule and brings us to the need to make an immediate decision is Mike found red pine scale out um, in the watershed land in the red pine. And my understanding, which Mike will, will, will tell you more about it, is that within a year or two of mortality of all the red pines, once you see the scale, is, is expected. So it's sort of, we have a lot of red, red pine in the watershed, and we're at the point where if we're going to do harvesting and things, then we need to move up the schedule to get some of those things done. And then that pushes our discussion of interfering vegetation that we'd started to have um, at a previous board meeting. So um, as I rapidly deplete my knowledge of the pine scale and forestry, I don't know if Nicole has anything to say, but Mike is also prepared <coughs> with, with props to, to talk to us. And if we were going to do something, am I right? This is the correct time of year? Is it into winter? Um, there's a lot of advantages to the winter, but yeah. We'd have to do whatever we could, even if it wasn't the winter. Huh. I believe, <coughs> BJ, you sent the report around to the board last week, so, mm -hmm. so you've all had a chance to read that. And the only thing I think I would add before um, Mike talks about the report itself is that there are um, many different alternatives presented in the report in terms of dealing with interfering vegetation, and two of those, I believe, um, include the use of herbicides. So. Um, what DPW staff and, and Mike recommend is a complete review of the state of practice of what other water suppliers are, are doing um, and whether they're using other sides. Um, and then we're also evaluating whether or not to um, complete a more detailed quantitative uh, risk study um, on, on the, safety, uh, the, the safety of using uh, herbicides in a watershed setting. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I did bring in a number of things. I'll just pass these around. This is some views of the red pine scale insect that we're talking about. You'll never be able to see that with the naked eye. Not life size? <laughs> Luckily not. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. We have talked about red pine in the past and, and Jim summed it up well. The red pine stands have been in a prolonged state of decline and we've been on the lookout for an insect called the red pine scale. That's the pictures that I'm passing around, which we had not detected. And the expertise on that is really Ken Gooch from DCR. Um, his exact title escapes me. I believe it's forest health supervisor. We brought him out in 2012, checked red pine uh, at Ryan and West Waitley. We didn't find any scale. We brought him out in 2013, checked at Roberts Meadow. Again, we didn't find any. Brought him out this August, 2014, he found some at Roberts Meadow. Um, based on that, looking around, I saw symptoms that were similar in some other areas, so we have also confirmed it with him. He, he's confirmed it at the Mountain Street and at the Ryan West Waitley. So it's in all three watersheds. And as Jim said, um, there's no exact number but when a stand is noticeably infested, um, complete mortality can happen within one to two years. And it's very likely to happen within one to two years. Um, to, um, to put this into perspective, uh, DPW in the three watersheds uh, has 37 red pine stands in six different towns. But it only takes up about 7% of the acreage. So, I guess that's some good news, is that it's so, sort of a contained problem. Um, but the fact that it's in six different towns and 37 different locations means that there's many different factors specific to each of those sites that would have to be addressed. Um, the, the worst uh, degree of infestation right now, as far as I can tell, is 
um, near Chesterfield Road, where Kennedy Road heads off, and there's a big cornfield belonging to um, Farmer Borowski. When you look from his cornfield, you see dead pines. And when I was last there a few weeks ago, I was encouraged by the amount of green that was still there when I was there just before this meeting. They're, as they say, brick red, which is not a good color for pine needles to be. So there's already significant mortality there. And this picture you see here is at the Mountain Street Reservoir on the east shore. Um, that's a view looking up. Those trees were alive because some of them have blue paint on them when I marked them about a year ago. And they're part of the timber contract that we have with Joe Adams. But now they're dead. It's not the whole stand yet, but this is definitely a canary in the coal mine. So with, the, with that stand and the one off of Kennedy Road, is it likely that the, any of the trees will be alive within a year? Probably not. Um, on some of the other ones, we have possibly two years. Um, there's no way to say exactly, but we, we know that we don't have three or four years. So there's a certain urgency to all of that. Um, to some extent, there's value in the red pine timber, uh, as long as it's alive. And um, so that could be captured if we do some timber harvesting. Um, in the classic forestry situation, you would simply cut some trees in certain ways and bring in from natural seeding and sprouting the native forest vegetation, it would replace it. That would, that would all be wonderful. Unfortunately, in some, in, in a, quite a few, but not all of these stands, there's a significant problem with oriental bittersweet. I brought in some more samples for you. Um, just different modes of, of what it can do, climbing on itself, climbing on a sugar maple in there, um, getting really huge with a root system that corresponds to its, to its size, of course. Um, Resprouting, this is all just from one vine that was about this size that um, on a project I was working on in Northfield, uh, the vine was killed with herbicide by cutting and putting the herbicide on the cut face. But about 10 feet away, a good chunk of the root system hadn't been killed by that one treatment. So this was just from about a week ago. I just plucked up as many vines as I could just in that moment. So the vine was definitely living on despite that one-time treatment. Um, and then this was, uh, I just pulled this up today just to show you, this is just one vine, it just shows you that it just goes on and on. And uh, it's, it's truly impressive, there's, um, there's almost no limit to how much this plant can grow. And um, the problem is, as we've talked about before, it completely interferes with the growth of trees, which is what we want for the watershed. Uh, first and foremost, for the water quality protection that's provided, um, but also for the habitat and for the potential timber value down the road. Um, with the, should we go to another slide? That's an up close look at what the red pine scale does as it um, goes through its series of multiple stages in its life. It puts out sort of a white cottony uh, fiber that protects it while it does what it does. It changes, as you can see from these pictures, radically from one look to another. It's pretty remarkable. Um, you can see the needles are brown, most of them. Um, next slide. Okay, we, that's what I'm passing around. Now when I show that to my 11-year-old daughter this morning, she's a gross. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a familiar view from the Mountain Street Reservoir. Um, that's red pine with vines. Now it's not only bittersweet there, there is a lot of poison ivy as well. Um, um, Virginia creeper and um, wild grapes in there too. Um, and, oh, on the subject of wild grapes, I just brought in a sample of a grapevine. So you see that they are quite comparable in terms of their size and together, um, they can really interfere with the development of the forest. Um, what would happen if 
uh, these red pines all die. I've simply released these vines and I'll just grow all the more. Up until now, there's been a little bit of shade kind of suppressing their growth. Um, without the shade, there'll be nothing holding them back. Um, and no new trees will be able to grow, which, which is the problem. Um, puts us in the awkward position because so far, a big part of our forest stewardship plan, and it's, it still is on the 93% of the acres that doesn't have red pine, is relying heavily on shade as a passive control on the invasives. Where, wherever they're established, we have not intended to do any cutting there so that we don't let in any more light. Um, when the, the shade is gone, you've got only one species and it dies, you don't have the shade anymore. So if we do nothing, we'll have a lot of dead trees, plus all the vines. But if we just go in and cut the trees and salvage the timber, um, we'll get some income from that, but we'll still have just vines. So really, even though we're talking about red pine, uh, we're actually talking about the interfering vegetation problem, which is just, it's all coming to a head in these 37 different stands. Um, next slide, please. Here's an example of what happens with, this is both um, bittersweet and grapes. That's at the mountain, I uh, know that's at Robert's Meadow um, on, on one of the parcels. It's in a red pine stand um, where, and I can't tell what happened, whether there was a blowdown or whether it was harvesting that was done in the late 80s and early 90s. But you can see that anything that's upright is covered with vines. Um, where, where there are no more trees, it's simply a mat of vines. And, and that's, that's going to be kind of the perpetual state that that's in, unless something interferes with, with what's happening there. Yes? If we had, are the vines bad for the reservoir? I mean, do they s serve to some e extent the same purpose as the tree? Well, um, tie down the soil. Yes. Eliminate erosion. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, compared to bare soil, let's say, the vines are better. Um, compared to what we're trying to. Uh, achieve and they maintain in the watershed, they fall far short. First of all, they'll never produce the height of an actual forest canopy with all the diverse sub canopy heights, which is an important part of capturing and filtering the rain. Um, the diversity in there will never parallel what it would in a forest of native species. So, yes, it's better than nothing, but no, it is not as good as we would like to see. So, and, 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 and I'll just add that, you know, if, if, if something like that would just simply stay in place, and it's a limited acreage at the moment, then that might be somewhat tolerable. But it's basically producing seeds by the bushel load every year that the birds take far and wide. So it's it's causing surrounding areas to become ever more infested. Plus, around the edge of itself, as vines pull in trees that are alive on the edge, it just widens. So if we were to just look at that and then come back, let's say we did nothing, and we come back in 50 years, you know, it could probably have, I don't know how big it would be, but it would be much, much bigger than it is now. And over, over time, uh, we'd have less and less forests, and we'd have more and more of that, and it would become more and more difficult to deal with. Okay, that's a grapevine you can see up close and personal. Uh, is that the last slide? Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, um, and we want to leave a lot of time for questions, so I'll just quickly uh, kind of get to the nuts and bolts of, of this report which you have, which is that for the 37 different areas, there's a specific recommendation that I've suggested for each one. And they range from tolerating the mortality that's gonna happen and um, either controlling the invasives and uh, I should say the interfering vegetation, non-native invasive and native. Um, so tolerate the mortality and in the case 
uh, that there are is engineering vegetation there and control it. In other words, don't just let it run amok. Um, partially harvesting the timber to capture the value and also reduce the nuisance of it, um, the, the possible danger and the unsightliness of it. Um, completely salvaging the timber, either to capture the value and or to reduce the nuisance. Um, and I, I have examples of each of these um, treatments. Um, or completely converting the red pine sand to a non-forest condition of brush mobile habitat, such as goldenrods that would seed in naturally, which uh, would be maintained by an annual mowing that would keep the invasives interfering vegetation at bay and would be at least not a nuisance to the surrounding areas of forest. So for example, um, in a remote area where it's hard for us to even get there, and there's one, for example, on the west shore of the West Waitley Reservoir, a small sand of red pine, there's no real point in going in there to try and salvage because it would be more disruptive just to even get there. Um, so just leave that alone. Just tolerate as an act of practice the mortality there. Um, where we have a chance to go in and, and, and salvage some or all of the timber value, uh, many of the stands around Robert's Meadow, um, we can do that and get the value from that and, and not have large amounts of dead trees within sight of the different roads that are there. Um, looking across from Musanti Beach, you see a whole stand of red pine that is difficult to get to, but will be quite an eyesore it all dies and possibly a hazard if people are over there hiking. So that would be an example of one where you would want to completely salvage as much as you can at least just to get out of there. Um, those are all scenarios where we're still going to have forest after we're done. We're going to be growing new trees or the trees already in place. We'll control the interfering vegetation if we can and a new forest will already be in progress from the moment we're done with our harvesting. The situation around the Mountain Street Reservoir, around the filtration plant all the way down to the west shore, uh, and a little bit on the south, south of the dam, those red pine stands are heavily infested with bittersweet, also grapes, to the extent that it almost doesn't seem feasible or practical to try and control the bittersweet. So that in those areas, my recommendation is that we convert them from the red pine forest that they are now to something that can be maintained by, by brush mowing, brush hogging. Um, it would be kind of dramatic. It's about 65 acres. It would be completely cut off. We would use a, a chipping type of operation to remove as much of the top wood and branches and cut low stumps because we want to bring in mowing equipment after. Um, in the other scenarios, forest scenarios, where we want to maintain forest, we would not use that logging technique. We would use techniques similar to what we've been doing so far, where we leave a lot of woody material in the forest because it's a benefit, long-term benefit to the water quality. So, final part of my presentation is how do we control these plants? Uh, first of all, the word control is, is actually an overstatement. Um, there's probably no way to really control these plants. Um, but what we are trying to do is at least allow the forest to continue growing. So that's kind of our, that's kind of our standard that we're shooting for. Uh, we don't want to go out there five years later and find all the trees that were started are now completely smothered with vines and there's no forest happening there. Um, we're very well aware, I'm very well aware that um, any talk of herbicide use is a very sensitive issue. Um, and I'll say right up front, anything I would say or know about herbicide, I'm just relying on what other people are telling me, what the label says, what any, you know, any research that I come across says. So that's why um, uh, I would 
like anything that I recommend that involves herbicide to be contingent upon a finding independent of myself that the risk is either non-existent or, or tolerable. And that's what Nicole was referring to earlier. But for the, for the possibility that no herbicide would be used at all, we have uh, a mechanical treatment approach where we would go out and simply cut these vines um, and then go back a total of three times each growing season and cut whatever is there that we can find. Um, you know, even uh, plants this size, you know, whatever's there, um, small plants coming up, we would pull up. Uh, anything big enough to cut, we would cut or clip and just keep at it three times a growing season for three years, three growing seasons, and then step back and evaluate whether we were successful or not or what we need to do differently. Um, we don't think that that would actually kill anything outright. Um, what it would certainly prevent is climbing of trees and setting of fruit. So we would, we would be restricting what the bittersweet can do and the same goes for the grapes. But um, chances are we wouldn't actually be killing any. Second approach, just to pick the opposite end of the spectrum would be bring in a complete um, herbicide treatment where you go in one time and you cut all the large vines and you put herbicide right on them, goes into the root system. Then you come back and for the smaller ones that are more foliage than stem, you do foliar sprays. And again, it would be over a three year period of time. Um, I can't remember exactly, five or six visits total because you never get it all with one pass through and there's always there's always reason to follow up. Um, the third approach we called integrated, um, which would involve a one-time use of herbicide, coming in and doing the cut phase treatment. Um, I like that in if, it, if herbicide is gonna be used. I like it because it is a very focused treatment. Um, you get into these substantial root systems that belong to the vines of that size and even though you don't necessarily kill it all with that one treatment, it's a significant um, knockback. And then you follow up with mechanical. You follow up with um, cutting, um, macheting, exactly how that would work out, you know, we would see uh, as we got into it further. So we have three different approaches for controlling um, the interfering vegetation. Um, the cost of all of them is, is high because it's a lot of work, a lot of visits. Um, a lot of time. The herbicide treatment uh, is the cheapest, the completely mechanical approach is the most expensive and it's only because it's, it's the amount of time. And, and my role in all of that, would, I wouldn't be doing any of the treatments myself. My role would just be setting up and overseeing the work that would be done. So that's so the end of my presentation. It is. <laughs> <laughs> right at three minutes. Um, so what we're trying to do tonight, we don't the, the three options that Mike describes, I don't think we're looking for the board to, I mean, obviously you're welcome to discuss any of it, but we, we, don't, we don't need a conclusion tonight in terms of how we intend on, on or how we move forward with managing um, the different vines. Um, what we do need tonight um, is consideration of Mike's contract which would allow us to do um, various things related to harvesting certain parts of certain red pine stands and taking other other actions, either letting um, letting some of it remain or whatever, but it basically implement the plan for red pine management that he's identified in this report. So the step really is to allow, if his contract gets approved, we would do cutting plans and do um, forestry activities in, in those areas, right? Yes. And then we're left with, as he works on that, Nicole and I and Ed and we'll continue to work on looking at how to deal with interfering vegetation in terms of the options and what they are and then we would come back with more information to the board to make a decision about what to do if anything in the area where the red pines have been cut down and we know we're going to have a problem with invasives with the bittersweet. Um, so I think that's pretty much I think where we are at this point. But. Um, we're, we're sort of on the fast track of needing to do something with the red pine in order to, to capture any of the value of the, the trees as they exist. 
Otherwise, it just becomes uh, a cost liability for us for safety reasons and things that we have to go in otherwise and, and remove them. Few thoughts. Um, no salvage value to dead trees. Is that correct? Not even cordwood or no. no. Not not the red pine. No. Okay. Okay. Um, we've talked about this before. This problem isn't isn't restricted just to our watersheds. It's sort of all over this region. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thought I have is um, since we attracted so much attention the last winter. It seems to me we need some kind of public notification program. And, and along those lines, I'm wondering, would we expect again to find people with a different viewpoint on how to attack this? What would might that be? I did mention 37 stands in six towns. <laughs> so it will be an interesting process of discovery to find out what the ideas are. Um, I mean, I was out cutting vines one day and a lady stopped to, let's just say, yell at me for about 15 minutes because how could I cut vines in the old days? The Indians never cut vines. We have to let nature take its course. So I would say that's going to be one type of response. Um, the thing is, um, we're not, it, it is an awkward position because there will probably be people thanking us for taking the pines away as they're dying or just before they die. Um, and the ones that we don't get to, there may be people complaining that we didn't do that. Um, it's going to be hard to make everyone happy. I did forget to mention, but a part of this proposal that I have is outreach. We do want to bring people in and show them what's going on. Um, with the sole purpose is that we want the forest to be able to continue to um, be in good condition in the future for the functions it's supposed to provide, water quality and others. And even the mowing, it's only, a, it, you know, it, we hope it won't be permanent, but at the very least it will be minimizing the harm that these plants can cause. So, I mean, that's what we have to keep explaining. and. Um, but there's no way that everyone would be happy. The red pine around Robert's Meadow, if you drive around up there and take a look, that's that's very visible for people. If we do if we don't do work it will be visible. If we do work it will be visible. So at least having some uh, outreach and information about what's happening there, whatever gets done would be a would be a good thing to do. And I think Nicole was looking at even I think we may have put something on the blog today just to let people know that we've found red pine scale there and that we have a problem that we're starting to look at. Mm -hmm. But um, clearly something that's highly visible. You also said that the Mountain Street Reservoir had 60 acres? But in the, that's where the, I, you know, the bittersweet and the, right. the grape is bad enough, but poison ivy. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's more than 64 acres of red pine there, but just in that one swath that kind of goes from the treatment plant down to the water. Right. That's, yeah. And that's an area where, where it would be a clear cut yes. and mowing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that would probably be noticed by yeah. the three or four <laughs> cars that would go by there. Bicycles. <laughs> it's, um, in technical, in forestry terms, it, it isn't. It is not a clear cut because in a clear cut you're regenerating the forest with um, certain species. It's but this is actually a conversion. Yeah, yeah we're, 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 you know, it would be similar to what uh, could be a habitat project. Yeah. It is going to be wonderful habitat for pollinators. Um, we're for a time we're not going to have a forest there if we do this, but we can always get one back later if conditions allow. Mm -hmm. You know just like most of the forest around us was once similar to that. How often would it brush off? Something like that, how often would it be three times a year? No, it would possibly once a year. Oh. Um, yeah, that's, I factored in once a year. What would have to happen is after the logging, it'll still, even with the whole tree chipping and everything, it'll still be in a rough condition. So we'll have to bring in something that is a very rugged mower that mows wood and we'll just grind it up. So that'll be a one-time thing. But then after that, uh, we'll switch to kind of a brush hog or flail mower. Uh, 
without much acreage, you can be, once you get up and running, different areas could be mowed in different years. So it doesn't necessarily all have to be done the same year. About how much would, uh, so if you did the treatment, and I know you said some of this stuff was um, had been treated once, the big vines, and yeah. then this stuff came back, presumably the root system goes way out, yeah. so it starts coming up. Uh, how much, how many lineal feet of vine would you get per year with that? How big is this stem get? I know Japanese knotweed, like you blink your eye and there's something there. It's, right. it's pretty fast. Right. Um, I don't know the answer. Okay. It depends on how much light. I mean, the, the thing that's very frustrating is they're shade tolerant. So they can grow just a little bit and stay alive in the shade. But then if light gets in, they switch to more of a weedy growth form. Could yeah. be feet a year though, right? I mean, in feet. the sunny... Yeah, feet. feet it's definitely feet per year. Feet per year. Okay. Feet. Yes. So, Mike, the timeline, um, you, sounds like you would suggest some of this cutting should occur this went this season. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from the point of view of salvaging the value, um, the sooner the better. Because, you know, a year from now, a lot of what's still alive and serviceable now might not be. Um, and we're ahead of the curve, but just barely, because if we have actual timber to sell, then, then we can bring people in who are you know, willing to pay to come in and cut it, you know, buy the timber mm -hmm. off us. But when it flip-flops and it's dead, then we're hiring people to come in and clean it up for us, and, and then that's just very expensive. So it's really, um, we don't want to go over that threshold <coughs> any more than we need to. And does logging the red pine predate having to figure out what to do about the invasives uh, by about a year? I mean, could, do we have a year to think about organizing we do. consensus? Yeah. And, and just so you know, I mean, all things being equal, the treatment of the interfering vegetation would have already begun before you start doing any logging because the logging lets in more light. So in that sense, it's not the ideal starting point. We've gone beyond that, but um, again, with that, it would be the sooner that we start, the better. We're, we're, we're anticipating that it would take about a year, or at least six to eight months, to work out the question of which treatment we want to use. But possibly something for this kind of growing season. Yeah, it could be in the growing season of 2015 that we could get started. But the logging could precede yes, that. Yes, it could. Yeah. In that direction. Yeah. Yeah. So my understanding of the treatment method is that the <coughs> if the plant is dormant, it won't take up the poison, so you have to wait for it to be active, is that um, right? With the cut stem treatment, you can do it while it's dormant. Okay. Yes. Um, with the foliar, obviously it's got to be right. when, the, when the leaves are on and there's certain criteria. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, these, it, that can be done in the winter. So I think we're going to move on to discussing a contract for Can I ask a question? Week. Yes. About the scale, how does it travel if it's stationary? There, um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, for uh, a good part of its life, its mouth is stuck in the tree. Um, it goes through so many different stages. There's a crawler stage where it's mobile. Um, it's said to be moved by the wind and birds, and that's how it gets from one area to another. So it's a source of food to certain bird species? Um, I don't know if it's uh, that they eat it, but it, that it's on them. They may get on the bird as the bird is doing whatever it's doing. And then the bird flies to another. So the bird is a host? It's, it's not, it's not, it's just on the feathers. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's just to piggybacks. But then once it's in this, once it's established in the stand, then it can quickly spread. Let's say it's established on a branch, it can quickly spread to the rest of that tree and then within that stand, you know, and it just, it's been in Massachusetts for a while. Um, it had a lot of mortality out in the eastern part of the state at the Quabbin, a lot of mortality. Um, and we've had it on our radar screen, but um, you don't really like to jump ahead to the worst case scenario uh, too much. Um, I guess in the Holyoke uh, water supply system at their big reservoir, um, what's that one called, Ty Carmody, 
they've got a lot of red pine that's dead all around the water. Um, it just died um, what, about 10 years ago. And um, when I was with Ken Gooch, the DCR health, forest health supervisor, he said, oh yeah, that was one of the places we discovered it. <laughs> one of the first places we saw it. So it's been right over there, but it hasn't really gotten to us until, I mean, we found it in August for the first time. <clears throat> It's probably been here longer than that, but not at a level that we were detecting, you know. So, now the horse is out of the barn on that, I would say. What are other watershed districts doing? Like, like Quabbin, what are they doing? Yeah, well, they originally had about 3,000 acres of red pine, which they reduced to about 2,500 through their normal harvesting. Then they hit that moratorium, so they still have about 500. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that their chief forester said they've lost about 250 acres so far. They've lost all the red pine on Prescott Peninsula during the moratorium on logging. Oh, to the scale? Yes. Okay. So if you look now, all those, they're all dead yeah. when you look over there. So because, they, because of the moratorium, they couldn't act and do the logging that they wanted to do. Okay. And what are they doing about the bases? They must have some of this stuff. Uh, you know, it is, um, it's a, it's, yeah, they're, they're well aware of invasives. Um, for some odd reason, barberry, is it Japanese barberry is especially bad <laughs> over there, but they have the other ones as well. Um, they've experimented with uh, flame throwing at the barberry. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't really work with the bittersweet or the grapes. Um, I don't, I think it's more experimental than anything. Um, they're in an odd situation where they actually by law could use herbicides to control invasives but they don't want to because they're afraid of the reaction sure. and sources can confirm this but this is this is my understanding um, the odd thing is that there are rights of way that go through the coven that they use herbicide to maintain themselves but the coven itself uh, management uh, does not has not I guess won't at, at this time. Mm -hmm. The other area I was curious about was the Monica Plains. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, we're going to wrap this up and move to the the next okay, portion sorry. where we're going to talk about a contract. Just a quick question on the sure, moratorium because I'm not familiar with the moratorium. Was the moratorium something that was imposed by, or who was the moratorium imposed by uh, with respect to Quad? Was okay. a, it was a statewide ban on logging. It, don't, it didn't only affect Quabbin, it all affected right. all state So it wasn't just a public outcry as a result of something. I'm just wondering, are we, are we running the risk here, some kind of moratorium affecting us <clears throat> as a result of some, some there, similar there public was, sentiment? There was a moratorium because of public outcry on, on a statewide level. Yeah, and well, in, in that the, the state then went through a long forest visioning process to get a lot of input. They had many public meetings, many educational sort of walks and sessions, and they did a lot of scientific research at the Quabbin about how the forest is managed. So there was a tremendous amount of work and effort that, that was put into determining how to manage state forests. They ultimately took different state forest land depending on its use and categorized them in different ways with different land management plans depending if it's watershed land or land that would be managed or land that wouldn't be managed. So they went to all the different state forests and came up with plans for each one. And that uh, that program has just been implemented recently to the point where they, they just started logging at Quabbin for the first time in like five years? About five years. Yeah. Yeah. Five years. So are we adhering to some of the same standards that they, that they had proposed with respect to, to logging uh, as a consequence of that study for state? Our work is consistent with, is generally consistent with logging done in the Quabbin, I would say, um, generally consistent with it. And, and practices for public water suppliers. So just in response to a public questioning, getting back to the woman who stopped, stopped you and, and gave you her opinion for 15 minutes, is that, a, is that the response that we would um, uh, be, you suggest that we would be, be making in, in, uh, with, the anticip with some anticipated public uh, reaction to this? Um, our response has been transparency. We had a lot of, um, there were a lot of questions that were asked back in the March time frame about what the city's been doing with water supply lands. And we've been very open and upfront, I think, in terms of what 
the department has done and what the board has endorsed in terms of our land management techniques. Um, ultimately, we, we made a presentation to the council that described to them the different things that we do, why we do them, how they're consistent practices with other water suppliers, how they're things that, that the state approves and is, uh, is supportive of. Um, so, I mean, that would be, that would continue to be our response to questions. But, we're, we're but was the potential for a red pine predicament such as we're facing here discussed as part of that, uh, those discussions? We, we talked about red pine mortality, but not related to the red pine scale. Uh, but we did some of the slides of the ones that are, yeah. like ones that I had used. Right, right. right. I'm just, I'm just trying to anticipate where the, the, the people who raised, might come from. The person and, and the people who raised the alarm here when we were doing some work uh, last spring, I think are not unrelated to the people who have been pressing on Quava. Right. But in any event, uh, the city council was initially alarmed. Um, and I think everyone was impressed by the work you two have done uh, to see that we have actually a fairly thoughtful, very well organized plan for how we've intended to manage the forest. And everything calmed right down and basically was over in no time. Yeah, well, that gets completely forgotten when they start mm -hmm. cutting. Yeah. That's yeah. the problem. And that's I, think it, you I start, think we have to start have to with the outreach that, ahead of time. You have to be able to reference the certain procedures that have been used appropriately to get to that point. It's a good point because the logging we've been doing hasn't been in Northampton. Right. The logging that we would be doing this time would be in Northampton. Yeah. And it would be very visible. Yeah, we've had people hugging trees and chaining themselves to trees down next to the old fire station. And in my memory, on Masonic Street, with a tree on Masonic Street that we were trying to take down. So, I mean, you're going to get a very different reaction for different reasons to yeah. situations like this when it hits so closer to home, it seems to me. Yes. And I'm sure you're aware of that. I'm just yeah. curious because it's uh, out of this, I'm just coming into so understanding it myself. Jim, you want to describe the contract you're uh, su suggesting we consider? Sure, the, there are four tasks, and maybe I don't know if Nicole wants to go, to go through it, but the, the first task is, or she'll correct me when I make a mistake. Let's, let's do that approach. Um, the first task is for timber harvesting, so preparing the, the cutting plans, doing the marking in the field, um, and then doing inspections during the work, so helping us with that sort of thing. The task, um, task one is $50,643. Task two is related to outreach and monitoring. Um, so doing green certification work, doing outreach implementation, working with Nicole and helping us with, with, um, with education in that, in that regard. Task three is related to helping us with determination of um, interfering vegetation controls, so evaluating um, the options, and then based on what we ultimately decide for the control technique, Mike would provide um, some administrative uh, review and assistance in the field when we started to undertake um, the interfering control uh, methods that we choose. That um, So the outreach and monitoring task was a $4,250. The inter interfering vegetation control task three was $11,500. And then we have a $5,000 task for forestry consulting for other things that come up that we, we don't anticipate at this time that we might need his help with. So that would be hourly assistance on sort of out of scope items that come up related to the work. Um, so that's sort of it in a nutshell. Mike did give us a an estimate uh, just to get a sense of the value of the uh, of the red pine that would be removed would be roughly on the order of $145,000. So his contract is uh, something the less my agenda. Right here, $71,393.88 for exacting proposal for Mr. Murray in this case. Um, but the proceeds should cover the work as described in here based on our understanding of the value of the red pine. Second. Initial questions, Mike? Well, I, I took a look at the contract. It's not the kind of contract I normally look at, but it um, looked okay to me. Uh, I also um, want to clarify when, when the board might get involved in the decision to actually move ahead with timber cutting. Is it when the contracts come in for approval? Or? So the timber cutting will occur before we know what we're going to do with vegetation. Yep. Um, I'm pretty sure that would be the case. Um, I think the board um, will keep you informed as we evaluate the three alternatives, as Mike had laid them out. Um, we're going to be talking with a, 
a consulting firm next next week, okay. Friday. Friday we have a conference call with, with CDM Smith to talk to them about getting some uh, information about what the state of the practice is with other public water suppliers that use uh, water supply reservoirs and surface water reservoirs. And we also want to talk to them about sort of risk analysis techniques that might be used to evaluate the different types of herbicides that might be used on beer sweet and, and figure out what a reasonable approach may be to look at this from a scientific standpoint, so state of the practice and then the science behind it. Um, and then once we get a sense of what that would be, if there was a contract with CDM Smith or another firm, we would obviously bring that in front of the board and have a discussion with you about the contents and scope of the work. And that, we think, will be an integral part of deciding, um, at least from a science-based perspective, what we would recommend for um, for a control technique. And we would also go back and review um, cost estimates for the different maintenance um, measures that would be needed in terms of mowing or uh, things over the long run. So it would be sort of science-based, financial-based, and ultimately, we would bring that information in front of the board to have a decision about um, which way to go or concurrence or whatever it is. So we have we definitely have work to do in that area, but keeping the board informed either through contracts or through the work that we're doing would be important. I, I was um, headed in a slightly different direction. I'm, I'm glad to hear that explanation, but um, I think we want to be comfortable that the public knows what we're doing before we start cutting the trees down. And so okay. um, th that that part, I think, is is as important. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So we um, we put something up on the blog today, mm -hmm. just as the first, we just found out about the red pine scale. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to get something on the blog just to identify the problem. And then, and then after the board meeting tonight, we would start doing more outreach about okay. what our specific plans are, what our schedule is the areas where the problem exists, so um, we could get information on the blog and talk to the Gazette about it. Okay. So, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, I didn't it's right. It was all good. good. We should plan also a presentation to the city council. I, th I think they were, I'm sure they'd be frustrated to get caught, caught by surprise again that we're doing something, even if it was on the blog. Or again? <laughs> Again, in the sense that uh, we just went through this last spring, I think we should probably start there rather than circle back to that. Um, do we get we get a timber cutting plan? Do we get deliverables that help with the GIS stuff? Better, ever better maps of the forest? Um, are there parts? Are there pieces in the cutting plan that become part of our database, or is it just a bunch of blue marks on trees, or how do no, we no, each um, cut? Well, I, I was just going to say that we actually already have that data. I mean, th some of it needs to be um, a little bit. I need to spend some time with Andy in terms of organizing it in GIS. But we have stand delineations within GIS, mm -hmm. and then it's just a matter of linking the cutting plans that have been done to date, or that, yeah, I would say that have been done to date in the GIS system as, a, as kind of a record keeping of what's been done on a state basis. So what's delivered mm -hmm. is readily adaptable to the GIS? We're, yeah. we're getting it in a format that's readily usable yeah. for the G, for updating GIS? And I mean, I would say yes. I mean, we're, yeah. we're getting paper copies, but then it's it's information we already have, so it would just be a matter of, of doing some work on our end to, to update the GIS system. So we have the forest stands in our GIS system already, okay. and then as we do cutting plans in the different areas, we document where those are, and then we keep track of them within GIS, so when I'm retired in 10 years, hopefully, or 20, whenever that is, and I'm not, no longer here, and Nicole's here, or not here, that there's a record there's a record over time right so when we disappear and other people are here we can go back so 50 years from now you can look back in 2014 and see that we worked in these certain areas and these trees were cut in this area <laughs> forest management is a very long-term horizon type of plan so having it you know the years and what was done in the locations is important i guess i'm thinking maybe mm -hmm. i'm overthinking it but just to make sure that for example when smith has building work done or something you're asking for the digital yeah. Uh, I mean, everything go just is delivered in a way that you can mm -hmm. put it into the digital yes, records. Well, we don't do paper anymore, really. Yeah. And I'm wondering if 
Mike can be working in a manner that just flows right in. I mean, we can scan the cutting plans and keep them electronically that way. Um, but I don't think that we, you know, the, I mean, there's any capability right now of us putting the work that you're doing directly into the GIS system. Uh, not really. I, mean, I don't know. Have, have you seen the cutting permits? No. Yeah. Okay. We've done, I think, 10 or 11. Each one of them has a very detailed map, which is based on the maps that you have in GIS already. Um, but specific to the cutting, there's notations about wetland and stream setbacks and all kinds of things that are specific on the on the paper map. No, so you're not opening up a file and no, working on a layer of a file? No. Okay. Barry DeCheats doesn't have a <laughs> pop-up screen in his <laughs> safety glasses. Not yet. All right, well, any further, any other questions? Comments? How long does this contract run? Three. How long does this contract take? Mm -hmm. It's a three-year contract. Three-year contract. All right. So a yes vote approves this contract to hire Mike for the next three years to work on cutting plans for the red pine. And we're going to gradually work our way through all 37 stands. Well, some of them, the recommendation is tolerate mortality, and there won't be any further work to do. Right. Um, but basically, we're addressing yes. all of them. Yes, exactly. Okay. So a yes vote approves the contract. All in favor of approving the contract for Red Pine Salvage Operations? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mike, thanks. That was, I, I thought that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you want to read? Yeah, yeah, next time, bring some poison. You want to read? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should I uh, clean up this mess, or should I leave it for tomorrow? You can leave it for the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I brought one home last time did you, to show my you, husband. You can yeah. take those. I, mean, I couldn't believe it. They work as firewood. Yeah. You know, you just Someone else brought them, too. We okay. passed them around in the oh. barn. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I knew I was in it. I just didn't think I... I washed them out. All right, can I have a motion to take old business number one out of order? Uh, so, so moved. moved. Second. Okay. So, in your board package is an amendment to chapter 285 29, instruction to sidewalks. It kind of came out of a conversation from the last board meeting and conversations that Terry Cohen and I have had. Um, Mike Parsons was instrumental in some of this work also the email you sent me. So basically what you have here is the existing permit and in red being what was supposed to be amended. And basically what we're asking to do is say, a sidewalk is obstructed when passage has been limited to less than 90% of the full width. Or we got it. Excuse me. Or three feet, whichever is greater and less than seven feet in height except for permitted obstructions and unpermitted obstructions that serve a public purpose, including but not limited to utility poles, street lights, shade trees, waste receptacles, parking meters, street furniture, and bicycle racks placed by the city, and roadside containers for the delivery of mail and news journals. It's not less than seven feet, right? Less than, less than seven feet in height. In height, right. So if something's hanging down like somebody's and she's down at five feet and poking your eye. Yeah. Oh, I see. I get I'm looking at the other one. Okay. So, so, Jasper, I know you've done a lot of work on this. Do you have any thoughts right. about this? Um, so, I actually didn't think that it was going to be moved up that soon. And so I was still emailing my boss and during when you said move it out of order, and then I caught the second half of that sentence. So I apologize. I just thought it was way down, and I have another half an hour, you know. Um, but basically, my view is that um, the definition should be in place so that residents whose, um, who, whose, whose properties are, are causing the obstruction can have a common understanding that's basically fair to everyone of what they're responsible for. Um, ideally, it would be crafted into an ordinance, but 
because there was no appetite for that at the uh, conference committee, it seems that because the current ordinance says that the board gets to define it, that that will be good enough. Um, I think that the 90% or three feet is good, but I would note that there are a couple of sidewalks in Northampton. They're on side streets and they're not terribly important that are two feet. Um, that may not matter. It may be the case they should, you know, provide three feet anyways. Um, I also think that the compliance period should be extended from 14 days to 30 days because um, most of the obstructions are by plants. Plants mostly grow in the summer and that's when a lot of people are on vacation. Um, so in, in, in deference to that, I think the compliance period should be extended to 30 days after the initial notice. Um, and let's see, is there anything else? Um, No, I think I think I think those those were my the the sort of baseline for, for what I'd like to see happen. Mike, it seems to me that that we next go to the joint committee on the twentieth, October twentieth, and review it with them, and then we meet two days later. Okay. So I don't know that we need to take any action. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, unless people want to take a different draft to the joint committee. That works for me. The, the, the joint committee has be, com become interested in this in large part because of your work. Um, yeah, and Jesse right. Adams is yep. asking for um, more detail about what's, what's the, what okay. constitutes obstructive. So that's interesting. Maybe we can distribute it to the committee before the meeting? I think that's... Yeah. So put this on the conference committee yes, agenda? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Minor, cor minor correction on yeah. it first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have too much time on this, but um, you mentioned uh, 14 days versus 30 days, and I really wonder if that makes sense, because if a big tree branch falls down and it's big and it's blocking the sidewalk, would we want to wait 30 days for that to be removed? And are we then also toying with the words in the ordinance, which I think we were, our charge was to create a definition? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would stick to I don't think the ordinance defines the period of compliance. I think the board does. Well, I could be wrong. Yeah, you know, the ordinance says 14 days. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So that, that part is in the city council ordinance? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. So, so that wouldn't be part of this decision? Yeah. All right. Thanks. So what, is, what exactly is, is the plan? Is it um, the conference committee will vote on it and then the board will vote on it in the same week? No, I, let me think how to say it. I, I'm just using this word, maybe it's not perfect, but as a courtesy, we'll take it to the conference committee. The conference committee doesn't have a, a, a vote on this in the sense of it's up to them. Okay. Obviously, if there were strong objections, we'd probably back up and take a look at it again. But they don't sure. vote on it in the sense that they're approving it. Um, but as a courtesy to them, I think we should take it back to them and see if they feel like uh, would agree that we've, we've gotten it right. So in other words, there's general agreement here, but you want to, as a courtesy to them, check in with them first because and then finalize some it of the questions them. came from them. Correct. But you intend to finalize it at the 22nd meeting? I think that would... That's what I hope to answer. Mm -hmm. Barring objections. Yes. Okay. And then from That's there, the, the process goes to city council for approval. So it goes down the ordinance committee, goes back no, up to city council. The ordinance says the board will define it. It, it may not really need any further work. But we'll find out. Jesse is going to be all over that, I'm sure. Councilor Adams. Yep. Um, all right. Excellent. Now we've got some great contracts coming up. Oh, number three. No, no, oh, number three. Comments. <clears throat> okay, let's review the Solid Waste Reduction and Environmental Protection Ordinance. Move approval. Move comments. Do I have to move approval? Yeah, I'll move endorsement? Or, I don't yeah, know. It's a recommendation, isn't it? So, so, there's two ordinances in the package tonight. One is 
272-18, and the other one is an amendment to list the enforcing officers as the Board of Health for this proposed amendment, which will give the city uh, basically um, diminish the use of thin film single-use plastic bags in certain businesses and also ban expanded polystyrene use. So the, the city council is looking for comments from the Board of Public Works on these two ordinances. Would that ban all expanded polystyrene use or is this mostly for restaurants and it's mostly yeah. restaurants. There are some small cabinets for small businesses in here. If you look at um, uh, my, the reference has to do with construction materials. I know the expanded polystyrene yes, is in uh, foundation, uh, uh, EFIS systems, um, and uh, maybe some other It's for food that. containers. Is what it's for. And it applies to businesses greater than 2,000 square feet in size which sell, serve, or convey foods directly to an ultimate customer. Mice are customers of that. Mice are customers of that construction Mice? site. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's used a lot. Well, that's an application where we want it to last forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it. Like I said, the city council is just looking for your comments for, as a board. Have there been any discussion with the business community or the retail establishments? That I don't know. We, we may not have that, any comments. I mean, mm -hmm. it's possible. Well, I know that back a couple of years ago, we were, the reuse committee, the recycling committee, was working on this, and it was a conversation that had happened about the reuse, and it was actually proposed a couple of years ago. So it sounded like stop and okay. stop in those places. There had been some discussion back then, but um, I don't know where that led to or what the outcome was. Those that, discussions were. Is that not recyclable now? Or do we do? We, is that separated out? Is that on the list of uh, non-recyclable items? Like, you know, over here. Yeah. Um, they, he's saying yes, and since he knows what he's talking about, I'm going to shake Stop my head. Stop and shop, as far as I know, is the only location that collects uh, plastic film. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. right, right. Well, they said, said that up a couple of years ago. There was some effort a couple of years ago to set up that recycling process. And there had been some discussion a couple of years ago about this ban happening, but it didn't. Didn't seem to move. What about expanded polystyrene containers? Oh. We don't recycle those, do we? We can't use that one. Can I suggest we return this with no comment? Sure. Do they have a date that they need to comment back by? Because I actually think Roe has been much more involved in this. It might be a courtesy to extend her comment until she has every opportunity to join us. I'm certainly comfortable with that. Do we have a I don't know of a deadline date. So um, let's table it at least for yeah. until the next meeting. Agreeable with everyone? Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, next um, for discussion, a issuing a contract for engineering services for a design, I presume, of the Mountain Street Reservoir Low Lift Pump Station to Garcia Galuska Denusa in the amount of $49,800. And that would be paid for by the Water Enterprise Fund if it were approved. Move approval. Second. If it were approved, Garcia Galuska and D'Souza would design uh, and help us with construction administration of the uh, emergency generator for Mountain Street Mobile Fund Station. Um, we had issued um, a request for qualifications for design services early this summer um, and received three qualifications packages for this work, um, one from Garcia Galuska de Souza, one from Du Bois King, one from Hill Engineers and Architects and Planners. Um, under the Chapter 149 uh, procurement process, we review qualifications and then we uh, negotiate a fee with the highest qualified firm. Um, we had a, a team of Ned, myself, and Diane Rossini from uh, Engineering Division review the packages and we selected Garcia Galuska as the most qualified based on the submittals. Um, 
we had asked for a price proposal from from them, uh, and they submitted one in the amount of $49,815, which we felt was a fair price um, for the work. Um, and the contract is here for your consideration. How much do you think the actual generator is going to cost? It's about it's like 400000 or something like that. Right. About 400. So emergency generator, building, connections, all that stuff. I took a look at it and it um, had the one minor comment I mentioned to Jim, but it was fine to me. Any questions about the the general concept of the project? How often is this going to be used? Pardon me? How often is this device going to be used? It'll Lucky use. never. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> like most good emergency generators, you hope you never have to use them. Can't you get one off the shelf for less than half a million bucks? No. It's a big generator. The pump station is a big facility. Um, so along that line, how many, um, what, what would this, what do the pumps move? How much water do they move? Because that helps put a sense of scale to it. Uh, I don't know how much, I forget how much they move off the top of my head. I don't know. It's, a, five, it's a 500 kW diesel fuel generator. Well, that's proposed. a start. That's <laughs> big thing. That's pretty big. A kilowatt is 75 horsepower? Is that right? Or I got that backwards? Seven and a half horsepower. How much, how much horsepower is in a kilowatt? Come on. This is kind You're of an engineer in the house? It's a scale thing. It's like I could. A I could. Engine or a big engine? I, miss I don't want to encourage this conversation uh, by Googling this. <laughs> well, uh, but we know that the treatment plant, the water treatment plant, can process. Four million gallons a day, or is it seven million gallons? A day? Uh, six and a half is designed for. Six and a half, yeah. and good. the city uses three to four million gallons. That's true. Yeah. So, so it would be it's that a lot of water. Right, it would be could a be lot of water. Three million gallons a day yeah. through those pumps. Yeah. It costs us two fifty to put the one up at Bear Hill, just for residential use, mm -hmm. pumping it up that hill from Bridge Road to mm -hmm. the top of the hill. So, they're not cheap, despite. Yeah. Not that that isn't a valid question, <laughs> but you hear half a million dollars or something we may never have to use. One thing I sometimes wish is that we that we I mean maybe or maybe we did, but I sometimes I think the time when we could have the most productive conversation about something like this is back when it's just in its gestation. I mean, you guys have put a lot of work into this already. And, and we've been kind of tacitly saying, yeah, maybe I'll come along the way. So there have been many yeses. And I don't even necessarily disagree that it's a good idea. But the time when we could talk about like, how, how often is this going to be, does this really make sense? I mean, so we had turbidity at the Ryan Reservoir for, you know, it just like, was it long enough? Does it really make sense to spend the money? We cut it out of the budget once 15 years ago. Have things really changed that much? Was that actually the wrong decision? It's too late to have that conversation. It's now never too late, right? So we had after Irene, we had discussions about the impact of the, the water plant because of water quality issues in and the problems of emergency power. We were very vulnerable during Irene to the point of not almost not being able to provide water to the city. Right. So that's a pretty significant problem. So we talked about it then. Um, we had a review of generator alternatives done in in. Um, 2012 by Tate and Howard, and we had a discussion after that study was done about getting it in the budget. It's actually been, the, the, the money to build the generator has been in the budget for two fiscal years. We just have never got around to the project. So we, the board had originally approved a contract with Tate and Howard to do the design. We were, we were going to give them the design contract based on their alternatives review and the fact that they knew what we needed only, and the board approved that contract, only to have it kicked back by Joe Cook because he said, well, it's a separate building, but you're connecting a wire to the low lift pump station, so it's a chapter 149 bid. You can't, you can't give it to Tate and Howard if you don't go through a qualifications-based selection. So we went through the QBS this time. Tate and Howard submitted qualifications five minutes late to me. We had to throw them out. So we went to the three, the three that we got, we got Garcia, 
to Susa Galuska. So I feel like it's a project that we've talked about a few times, but until we pull the trigger and build it, I feel like it's never too late. If you want more information from and us. Rebid it. Mm -hmm. Good. Later. Pull it off six months. Uh, what, I mean, we're, I'm happy to do whatever you want to do. We, we have talked about it in the past, and I can put information together again about, um, you know, the cost, how often we think we're going to use it. I mean, it's a it's a maintenance thing too. The generators, it, it, it sounds like you you would know. Uh, you have to exercise them. They break. I mean, the one the generator has been less than a garden party up at the water plant. We spent a lot of money trying to keep that thing moving, and it's fairly new. Um, but it's never too late until the thing is in the ground. So if, if you feel like you want more information, we tabled it once. This one with Garcia, we can do it again. Um, if you want to, you know, revisit Pat's new to the board, I'm happy to provide more information. Um, well, I'm not but, saying I don't bring anything to the party here. Just it's just a, yeah. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, since this conversation's come up, why don't we table it and look at the report from two years ago and refresh our memory on how we got to where we are? I mean, I, I, I think by putting it in the budget, we had those discussions yeah. you're talking about at budget time as we, mm -hmm. the staff first recommends projects, but we, right. we give them some consideration before we move ahead. So I think there's been this presumption that we're going to do it, but if we're uneasy. Let's let's revisit. It. What was the fifteen-year-ago decision when the treatment plant was in designed. the design of the treatment plant? Yeah. Is anybody memory good enough to recall what that might have cost at that time? Oh, no I mean, idea. I mean, it, it seems like in the context of what the cost of the treatment plant was to cut something in the vicinity of a half a million dollars. I'm, I'm just, I'm just under, trying to understand why that might have been such. I, I, I may have the numbers wrong, but the, the treatment plant went from 11 or 12 to 15 or 16 to 25 or 26. 25, what was it? So 30, 20, 30, 20, 20, 28 or 30? Yeah, it just, it just like yeah, was well, that's exploding. What I'm saying. Okay. It, is there, it, and, and was that? I mean, what portion of that? Actually, uh, not to go over this old, old news, I suppose, but I'm just wondering if that the real merit of cutting that at that particular point with respect to what, it, what you were actually, what the treatment plan was actually costing us. Yeah. Such a smart I mean, the piece that we've heard is that we probably didn't understand back then was that there may be occasions where we can't rely on the Ryan Reservoir and the feed that, by that gravity. That was the problem. When I just, I, I'm and, thinking to myself, yike, that is, that is and, a big surprise. And that probably wasn't anticipated. Yeah. Then. That was great. Yeah. So, yeah. Plus the reliability of the power. You know, that, that, that power plant, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, pumping station that I referred to at Bear Hill kicked on when the lights in Florence went out in that Ryan Road accident about three months ago during the summertime. It was an accident in Ryan Road and all the lights in Florence went out one night mm -hmm. and it kicked on at that point because it was needed to pump the water up the hill. And that's the only time in six or seven years that it's... And so that triggered the need to go in there and make sure that thing was working properly and, and serviced uh, regularly. And so if it was <coughs> East Hampton, then it would have gone on today. Right, with all the hemp going on, boy. So, Jim, I wasn't trying to unravel this. I'm totally, I'm totally yeah. fine with it. I mean, it, it, it's been a while. You know, I, I, I recounted the history some, and it's, it's, it's foggy. Maybe foggy at best for some, and like I said, Pat's new, and we can wait a board meeting or two, and, and I can send the alternatives to me around and more information. Um, I want everybody to be comfortable with it. I mean, I'm totally fine with that. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be my point. This ties into something we're going to talk about later, but uh, the mayor's proposal to reorganize things <coughs> totally re envisioned how contracts are. Mm -hmm. And as I've been thinking about it, I think it may behoove us to get our input in earlier enough in the game, because at this stage of the of the thing, we're not, we're out of it. Uh, by the time that they're ready to release it, that, that that's a decision that Ned and Jim make and the mayor. And our chance for input has long passed. Well, more or less. So we're taking so, this. Right. So we're going to do a vote on something, or let's see. We have a vote to, to approve and a second. Um, Motion to table takes precedence, right? Doesn't a motion to table take precedence? 
Okay. okay. Sure. Motion we table the conversation. Right. Second. Second. All in favor of tabling this issue until we have a chance to look at the old report. All right. Aye. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> um, okay. Now, next for your consideration, a contract for sodium carbonate to Astro Chemical in the amount of thirty-five thousand seven seventy-five, and that would be paid for by the Water Enterprise Fund. Move approval. Second. So this is our annual contract for pH control at the water filtration plant. Uh, we had four bidders this year. The high bid came at uh, $39,825. Obviously, the asteroid was the low bid. Uh, last year, it was 27.17 cents per pound. This year, it's 26.5 cents per pound. A little bit lower than last year. Any questions or comments? All in favor of approving the contract for sodium carbonate? Aye. Aye. Uh, for the next one, two, three, the next five items are all contracts for snow plowing. Um, can we take those as a group? So move. Second. So these are our annual contracts we have with contract snow plow operators for the city because we don't have the manpower of the fleet to be able to do all 49 routes. Uh, these are uh, mimicking what Mass Highway is paying for work on their routes also. It also includes a, uh, a fuel increase each year on it, based on a number of few years back. Just so you know, on average, we're probably paying each truck contractor about $8,000 a year for plumbing city streets. It's just kind of an average number. There's some here that have a number of trucks, some here like... Um, uh, Only Melnick. Melnick has, I believe, three trucks or four on the four, four on the fleet. One versus day everyone day. else has a single truck. Why is Skasky worth $2.50 more an hour? Different size truck. Bigger. Yeah. There, um, in the contract, there's different codes. Right. So code 3,000, he's a 4,000. It's a bigger truck. Right. You might have a foot wider plow on it. Yeah. Things like that. So the number that you're using for the threshold for the monthly fuel adjustment <coughs> is what, you know, roughly is per, per gallon? It's based on mass DOT. It's and it's I'm just curious because it's supposed to be going down, that's all. That's what I've been reading. So I'm thinking maybe we're on the good side of that. So the rates will be adjusted monthly based on the retail rate of diesel fuel from the New England region as published by the Energy Information Administration of the Department of Energy. The base rate will remain unchanged for the duration of this agreement. So it could go up, it could go down. It's a fluctuation. Okay. There's a site we have to look at. To so we're going with the flow. Please. Yes. Right. So, so there's a non-home increase from last year, such as uh, code 3000, went from 75.20 per hour to 77.46 per hour. Code 4000 went from 77.50 per hour to 79.83 per hour. And they haven't been raised for about five years, I yeah, think. This years. is the first time they've gone up in a while. So the reason to stay consistent with what the state is offering is so that we don't lose the qualified um, outfits to have the proper vehicles to be able to handle our streets to a state contract where they would ostensibly be paid more were there to be a differential. Right. Yeah, okay. So this includes everything. It includes fuel, breakage, yeah. um, yeah. lever, everything. Yeah. And just to clarify, we're, we're approving or uh, we're, we're considering uh, number six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Yes. That mm -hmm. is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Just one other question. What percentage of the total number of streets that we have to plow do these contract uh, companies uh, provide? I don't know the about the miles, total. but they're eight routes out of 49 routes. Okay, so, yeah. And then if our trucks break down, sometimes they, they have help to fill in. So yeah. Do their trucks break down before? Well. <laughs> They do they break get down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just information. Thanks. All right, if you're ready. Let's uh, vote. Um, <coughs> so a yes vote would approve these five contracts uh, for snowplow. All in favor of approving the contracts. Aye. Aye. Next is a contract for winter salt <coughs> to Morton Salt. I love it. I know. <laughs> in the amount of three hundred and fifty-eight thousand. <coughs> excuse me, three hundred and sixty thousand. I know it would be paid for out of snow and ice. Move approval. They actually merged with, we went 
We usually have international salt and Morton bottom out. When it rains, it pours. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, what was that saying? So this year we saw a dramatic. Have you voted? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. We saw a 21 percent increase this year. Yeah. Last year was 73.90 per ton. This year it's 89.59 per ton. We only had one bidder. Well, that's because they merged. <laughs> right, so we're cutting down the competition and the price is going up by all that. I heard Springfield had an even larger increase. 50%. Almost a 50% increase. So there's fewer companies supplying this. Do we have to um, reach out further? We put it out to bid as we typically do. Last year I think we had six or seven people take out the bid, but we only had, I think, three bidders on it. Yeah, we sent it to everyone that has ever yeah. had it, but they, no one else yeah. did. Because there's a shortage. The rumor is that there's a shortage this year. We were very lucky. We actually filled our salt ship to capacity last year. So we've been able to quite a bit of the winter, winter at this point. Not going to look. Great. Huh. Okay. We probably have, um, according to Richie uh, Parcelletti, we probably have 2,500 to 3,000 tons in storage. Um, any other? Yeah. Is, the only thing we use on the is this the only salt remover we heard? Ice remover we use on the streets? Yes. Well, don't use goo. No. It's actually coated. Oh, this is treated salt. This is okay. Any other uh, thoughts or comments? All in favor of approving the contract to purchase uh, road salt? Aye. 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 Next is change order number three to contract 17-15 for the Eastern Avenue drainage improvements mm -hmm. to J.L. Raymakers and Sons in the amount of 17,000. And that's a stormwater project. Move approval. Second. So um, this is a 15 point increase. Majority of it is from um, basically Groundwater found in greater excavation that had to be done on the project as far as with stone, increasing the amount of uh, unclassified backfill, um, materials for trench repairs on top, asphalt, and so on. If you want, I can go through the entire uh, thing item by item. The first one is a, if you'd like. I sent it out. You sent it out to them? Yeah, I, I, did, I didn't today. go through it already. I don't know if you had time to look at it. It's more or less a, a balancing change order. We're pretty much near the end of the job on this. Okay. And there were some changed conditions in the project that resulted in some items going over, and there were some items that came under. So the goal of the change order is to account for, for some additional work that the contractor has done, and to um, reduce the, the amount on some of the items where there was an underline. Yeah, he told us about this last month at this meeting. At the back of this, yeah. the closet. To Everyone's comfortable. We could vote on this. Yeah, okay. all, all in favor of approving the change order to the drainage improvement contract? Aye. Aye. So I had a nice meeting with the mayor this morning. Um, basically, we talked through his proposal for the administrative changes. Um, my impression is that um, within municipal in governance, that profession, um, broadly speaking, they feel that boards and committees and citizen-led initiatives is a little bit of a, a relic from the 19th century. And still perhaps suitable for towns or uh, you know small municipalities but less so these days for larger cities um, broadly speaking they're trying to professionalize it you know you notice in the in the paper he's talking about leaving decisions to the professionals uh, I think broadly speaking there's a move to streamline governments streamline uh, authority going down and accountability coming back up um, so he views this as a, um, a more modern mode of uh, municipal governance. Um, 
obviously, it's a compromise. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's unworkable. So he, the, gov, the mayor imagines that our board would continue to function essentially as it does now. It would become a commission rather than a board. We wouldn't have to approve contracts, um, the snow removal contract, you know, renting snow plows, that sort of thing, <laughs> which is not all bad. Um, he thinks there's still a need for some group like ours, though, to dig into the details of what the department's planning, what they're doing, uh, how they're doing it. So he, it's his hope that everyone who's on this board will continue. He, he doesn't foresee any personnel changes. He doesn't want any changes. He's actually quite happy. From his perspective, we're doing a great job. And he's not trying to shut us down or um, really fundamentally change what we do. But it would be more advisory. Um, I suppose there might be a time when the city government chooses to ignore our advice, you know, but it's, it, that's certainly possible. Uh, in terms of timing, this ordinance or this uh, administrative order has a 60-day clock. He filed it on September 30th, and on November 30th, <coughs> if the city council does nothing, it goes into force. If they endorse it, it goes into force. The only thing that could derail it is if the city council actively votes it down, say that they do not approve this change. Um, but if they simply uh, do nothing, it will go into force on November 30th. And I remember I was on the board of uh, Valley Health Plan when we merged with Kaiser. And as soon as we had that vote, we were out of a job. Because we didn't even have to adjourn. We, we disappeared when we voted to merge. Uh, he doesn't see it happening that way here. Um, he sees it that we will continue to meet. We can finish the meeting we're in. It's just that we're a commission at that point, not a board. Um, I think it's going to happen anyway. So it's not like we have the option of derailing this. So my interpretation is that um, as a commission, we'd be advisory only. And we'd, so our votes would be advisory to the department. We'd be making no decisions on our own. Is that correct? Right. What I didn't talk to him about, I was thinking about it later. Um, I, I think I know what the answer will be, but I, I took a, uh, a course in uh, board leadership uh, at Smith College. Years ago, I was the uh, president of the board at um, Children's Aid and Family Services. And Smith College had a, a, a weekend course for board officers. And they really stressed how important it was for boards to have their own agenda not just show up at a meeting like, what do you have for us today? You know, and wait for Ned and Jim to introduce us to today's topics. But they want us to come to our meeting with, this is what we want to accomplish, and is there anything you guys need? Um, you know, you've got to strike a balance there, of course. But. So does, is there room here for us to be pursuing our own agendas? Um, ways in we, which we would like to see the department adjusting to what's needed in the city or things that we'd like to see the department begin working on or you know our our thoughts our agenda as, as opposed to merely advising them on what they're doing or receiving information about what their updates and I think it's important that we retain our own agenda here. somebody to accept the blame for things when they go wrong. Exactly. Well, now we can blame the city council. So I think that uh, that uh, what we're seeing actually is a manifestation of the charter change that, that uh, went into place. That 
among other things, lengthen the mayor's term to four years and give him added responsibility. I've served on, um, they've had four charter commissions since 1970. I've been on three of them. And um, it's been, uh, for the most part, an exercise in futility because it was a very hard process to, to change the form of government and at the same time not have that be interpreted as a personal attack on the present uh, department head or whatever it might be. We ran into a number of situations like that over the years. And in this case, what they're trying, what I think he's trying to do, I wish he'd said something to me before he appointed me to the board and took away all the <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> it would have been nice. <laughs> but I asked him about that this morning because I was in there yeah. at 8.30. <laughs> it, it, but I think what he's trying to do is, is, um, is uh, draw a firmer line between the executive and the, and, and the legislative. And the consequences of that to us and other boards not now, now to be commissions is that the, the, the traditional responsibilities that have, that have uh, manifested themselves throughout these uh, changes in the charter and, and, and other um, changes in the, within departments. There used to be a sewer commission and there used to be a water commission. You know, it's mm -hmm. all kind of evolved with time. <laughs> and now it, there's, it's clear that there's, there, there's a, a very clear uh, separation of power between the, between the executive branch and the, uh, and the legislative branch. And it plays out in different ways with all the boards like ourselves. And so that role is going to diminish exactly in the, in, in the way that uh, you've described, Terry. And I think it's going to change, you know, in terms of, you know, how we operate in this interaction here because they're working um, uh, on the department level and we're on an advisory level and instead of the board relationship, which uh, everybody has grown so accustomed to over the years, and now I'm on my second time around, you know. Yeah. So it's... it's um, it's well within his authority to, in, in power to do it, um, and he's certainly gotten some initial criticism from some people who thought they should have been, been made more aware of it, but really it shouldn't come as a surprise because the, the charter was passed some time ago. He's got a four-year term now. Yeah. We're well into that, and if you read it and understood it, this is what was coming. So it's in many ways it's meant to streamline government, but it's going to change the way we operate. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the choice as to how much of that he wanted to do. He's taking a rather dramatic brush at it here in, 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 uh, in manifesting all these different changes and in, in, in how the boards operate. Uh, I think it's important, however, to, uh, that you know, uh, there's a certain expectation in the community. Uh, you're going to have a tough time getting people to serve on advisory boards, I, I think. A uh, much tougher time than you are on the kind of boards that we've been used to serving on because it, it diminishes the role. Yeah. You know. Um, so I think we should give thought as a, as a board to how we want to operate. You know, I don't talk about agendas. I haven't been able to, you know, get caught up enough to figure out what an agenda should be, but it's true that we need to have one, and we need to be able to <coughs> promote those things that we think that are important to the functioning of this department in a way that is consistent with, with our own, you know, um, um, ideas and, and, and goals. Um, so, you know, it's... A, it's, it's we have to live with this change. It's going to be different. It's not yeah. the, the dynamic is changing, and so we have to uh, understand that the, com the, the the council has some. They've got like a they've got like a you know, police advisory committee or something like that. And you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that come out of it. The public works yeah. advisory. Committee. That's what he and thinks is going to happen. Yeah, and he's he, and he mentioned that, and it was the kind of thing that was talked about in examples when they were talking about how the the new charter might work and uh, much more of that sort of thing and uh, you know that's good I mean that uh, there's an opportunity to advocate is what you want to be able to do because there's going to be things that are important to this department that uh, need to have people like us out there um, helping promote it you know and helping the community understand it you know and uh, whether it's you know the the red pine problem and yeah. all that's dealt with I mean it's it's, 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 it's this is going to be a a very different dynamic as we sit here and go forward from what you've all been used to and what I was used to before. So we'll see. So, as an example of, of what Pat was just talking about, um, basically the separation between the legislative, the city council, and the uh, executive, the, the mayor, and the whole city, the, the whole pile of city departments. The, um, 
is ever more separated now. So for example, a joint committee doesn't make as much sense. Uh, so that goes away. Mm -hmm. um, and as Pat alluded to, there might the city council may in, in time set up a little subcommittee for public works, but that's entirely up to them. Mm -hmm. and that's, there's an arm's length distance between the executive and the it'd be smart to do it because of the very point you raised in the paper which is the two year there's still two year terms yeah they can't grasp all i can tell you having served yeah. 10 years with them on there not and then there's any disrespect but it's tough enough um, yeah. grabbing the hold of the things that happen week by week let alone something that has the, uh, the in terms of of, of of the water enterprise funds or any of the other areas mm -hmm. that we have responsibility so that'd be smart to appoint that advisory committee yeah that was a very good point that you made in the paper because that's that, that's a soft spot as far as I'm concerned. You yeah, know, they, there's, some, there's a lot of spending that's coming up. Over the next 10 years, we're going to have to tackle wastewater, which is going to be very expensive. Right. Um, but in this new iteration, in this new advisory capacity, rather than how we exist right now, we would relinquish budget control? Well, I guess we could be we have as much impact as we wanted setting to. Setting the rate? Rates no, no. no rates. Well, mm -hmm. advisory only. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought we'd still review the budget and offer yeah. an, yes. mm -hmm. an opinion. Yeah. We, we can be as vital or as uh, have as much impact as we want to, is the way I'm thinking of it. Um, if we dig into the, the budget and, 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 and really comb through water, sewer rates, whatever, I mean, it's satisfying on our side and any recommendation we make probably means something. We'd be pre prepared to go chapter and verse as to why that was the correct recommendation. I think we could be, be retain our value. It might make more use of it, the more controversial it became. You know, if rate setting, for instance, becomes a, a source of, of trouble for them as they approach water and sewer decisions down the future, they may. <laughs> Be happy to have an advisory yeah, committee who can say well, they, this they is what they recommended. I mean, you know, I think how long. I mean, we spent a lot of time sort of learning our budgets and understanding them before we made the decisions about setting rates or how we were going to approach that for the long term. And uh, you know, I, I think we do a very thoughtful process on that. I would hate to see that lost. Yeah, it is. I mean, the city council have so much to do. I know. That's right? what it's, yeah. E even the ones who come to the joint committee, you realize that it's still only superficial. Yeah. Their their knowledge of this. It's not an area you can not that superficially understand very easily either. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the rate setting part mm -hmm. of it and the enterprise funds and, enterprise and, funds and the yeah. budgets. There's a there's, I mean there's there's three or four major budgets in the city that need to be considered and it's overwhelming. Having mm -hmm. sat there, I can mm -hmm. speak from yeah. certain my experience. Uh, so this is still unfolding. Uh, the City Council has a hearing next week, I think. Um, I don't personally feel motivated to get up on the stump and rail against this. Um, I think this ship is... He, I don't think he even notified Ned and Jim until he had already sent it to the Council. Is that true? Or it was the mail, he was dropping the mail, the letter in the mail and told you? We had a meeting last week with the mail on Friday. When did he sure, Thursdays sure. when he brought up yeah. the council, because that that's when Jesse Jesse took a shot at. We met with the mayor Friday before the Tuesday it was submitted. Okay, so it was an advance of the submission. Oh, so you have a few days to work on. So. All right. Can I, can I add something? Oh, you, of you course. Get ready to move on? Yeah. No. Just, go ahead. I just wanted to speak from a, I guess from a staff perspective, if I can say something carefully. Um, I find great value in the in the work that the board does um, and in, in the review of the work that we do. We're professional. I feel like we do a great job. But having the discussions about the things that we do and being able to have, um, you know, discussions about why we make decisions or how we how we want to move ahead and revisiting those with the board, even the solar pump stations contract is a very good example of that. Although I may have seemed annoyed a, a little bit when I was recounting the history to Terry, the point is, is that I love to revisit things like that to make sure that we are, in fact, making proper decisions and that people have input. And we, we mull things over and work very hard within the department to make sure we're making good decisions. But working with a board like this, I feel, adds great value to the work that we do. Um, so, you know, from my own 
personal perspective, I'd like to see if it's a commission, whatever it is, I greatly value the work that the board members put into the work and and um, I think it's very helpful for us to hear that type of input. So I don't can't predict the future and how things would go, but I find it very useful. I think the community probably finds it useful too. I'm, I'm making little notes here about the Upper Roberts Dam, um, the landfill expansion, the forestry program, the Storm Body Flight Control Utility. I mean, these were very, very large board initiatives that uh, was, they were extremely helpful. I mean, I look at like the Upper Roberts Dam, there, there was a, a large controversy there and there was a lot of discussions and many public meetings and the board's assistance in dealing with trying to publicly vet what the city was trying to do in that regard, I, I found very helpful professionally. And I think probably this, I mean, not everybody was happy at the end of the day on that project, but everyone, I don't think there was one person that could say they weren't listened to. And to me, that was, that's a, that's a really important part of the board. Um, because you guys do a great job at that, and that's important on controversial things. And in the future, I don't know exactly how that would work, if it's more advisory or, or whatever, but I guess my point is just that I think that the board has provided valuable assistance to the department, and I hope that continues no matter what it's a commission or a board or whatever. One of the other things we did, then, uh, just for just a frame of reference, is that I think it was the one in 98, when that, that's when it was on the council. It was. Uh, we went, we went ahead and uh, got uh, brought into uh, the discussion a dozen other communities in, the, in you know in the region as to how they handled various other things, including you know boards of public works commissions and things like that. And the trend clearly was toward uh, away from the way that we were doing it as a city at the time, and more toward what the mayor seems to be promoting at, the, at this particular point. I think that you know there was a period of time when when the uh, when the analysis basically was uh, form A kind of government, form B kind of government, or some other form of government, which had to do with the relationship between the mayor and the council, strong mayor, weak council, weak mayor, strong council, various other things. And that, and, and that seemed to shape a lot of the discussion. But as time went on, and I'm talking about having done this since 1973, as time went on, the communities themselves were, were putting themselves more into a business uh, model of a, 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 a top-down kind of responsibility for running communities and, and that's where the advisory roles of the various boards and commissions that are being discussed in this part of this change that he's promoting uh, came out of and sprung out of really, I think uh, at least from my foggy memory that's how it went. So I think that if we go out and examine now you know Western Mass communities of similar size I think you'll find that more of them are up to the uh, doing the, the work in an advisory way rather than as we've traditionally been handling our responsibilities here. After that we went on and talked about a couple of other things. Uh, the states finally released that three million dollars that um, Patrick, uh, Governor Patrick, talked about a year ago? Long time ago. 2012 it, bond bill. It's finally been uh, released and it's in our checkbook. Well it's in the city's checkbook somewhere. Um, we're going to meet with the. What was that money for? That's for the William Drainage Street Drainage Brook. William Street Brook, Brook down here, the fairgrounds. It's not for the fairgrounds. It's for that area. But it's area. because of the fairgrounds that we got it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Clement Street Bridge. We're going to meet with the. Bay State Village, the Bay State Bridges, the Clemens, uh, Friends of the Clemens Street Bridge. Bridge. Yes, Friends of the Clemens Street Bridge. <coughs> sometime, uh, sometime later this month, probably Ned and I. Um, we have $50,000, which is not perfectly defined. It's, it's available for design work, for asking questions, for answering, answering questions, I guess would be a better way to say that. Um, we need a plan, and I think, say it was my thought that the neighborhood should be pulled into this, the discussion before we put out an RFP so that they have some sense of where we're headed. Apparently Peter Cocott thinks there may be $450,000 possibly available if we come up with some work. It's clear the state won't have money or time or attention for that bridge for years to come. could be on a scale of 10 years before the state, even if we ask them pretty please and they said yes 
it could be 10 years before anything happened because of that, yes. Um, so it's clear we have to make some decisions about the bridge and use city money in the meanwhile. We can't use check in 90 on that, right? Uh, you could. could okay. But it's a decision. I mean, you know, it's, it's diverting, you know, is that worth more than all the paving we did this year, right? You know, how, how do we make that decision? So at least we're going to talk Vehicle to them. trips per day. Or average daily trips or whatever. There What's should be like software that could just tell you what's... Enter three different numbers and you get uh, yeah, some. Yeah. Yeah. Some. <laughs> yeah. So if you're looking for any input, <laughs> I use it about six times a day. <laughs> okay. So my office, back and forth. We know where you're going to stand. Chill. Yeah. Yeah. So I keep it open. <laughs> uh, and then the uh, last thing. Um, oh my God. What did we talk about there? Oh, I talked about pavement. Um, so finally, we spent city money on pavement this year. It was great, and I think it's so cool driving down the parts where we've done the work. Um, I have the impression it was a lot of work for the department. That's it was a lot of work. Yeah, it was a ton of work managing that, and it's kind of like Two feast times. or famine. You know, we, we get a million dollars, then the plan was we get, then we get nothing. So any work we do to ramp up collapses and then we're gonna get even more money in a couple more years and then you have to almost start from scratch maybe that's not quite the right word but the department has to totally jump on the that for a brief period and so I made the case to him like couldn't like just give us 500,000 a year this is great just keep it up don't don't you know don't give us this and then my my argument would be the staff then has a predictable, steady workflow that you can, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but that mm -hmm. was my argument. We, it's a very good point. We've been talking internally about um, expectations and managing the amount of capital projects that we do, because you've probably noticed from year to year on the capital plans, there are some years, although the pump station is one of these projects, that money has been in the budget for two years and we never got to the project. And we've been David Ludahe is here who manages the engineering division day to day and Ned and I we started to have discussions about expectations about the amount of work that we can actually manage. The pavement is actually a, is a very good point because if you were to talk to David, he, he and two of the engineers were running around this summer when the contract started, but also the, the amount of effort that went into getting that bid together was uh, it was a, a lot of work to get the bid documents together. So like you're saying, the workflow, it, it tends to be up and down, and if you're really focused on a huge paving contract, then all the other things that you want to be doing or the other things that you need to be doing, you can't do. And we're, we've been having the discussion a little bit about trying to set what are the expectations for workflow for engineering in terms of managing capital projects. Because we hire engineers to do work for us, but you, those contracts need to be managed and they require a lot of time in and themselves, although we don't actually do the design. So workflow ends up being very important, and we need to determine what what's a steady state sort of amount of work that we can deal with without going crazy, um, because there's a lot of projects that we fall behind on, and um, quite frankly, you don't want to plan a project if you can't do it. So what is, is it? Because the expectation is that you can, right? So if you look at paving, I don't want to keep going on about this, but we, we talked about you know what if it was there was a four million dollar paving contract one year, and you start to ask the question. How would you well, the point I made to the mayor was if, it, if it's a steady state, at some point you say, you know what, we should hire another engineer who can focus on this year round. And, you know, if you, if you can make the case and, mm -hmm. and show how there's work in December, January, February in preparation, or something, you'd have to figure it out, of course. But at some point it would make sense to hire someone whose primary res responsibility is babysitting pavement on a year round basis. Um, if the, hole engineer. If if, <laughs> if 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 it's all over the map though, the budget, then it's hard to make the case mm -hmm. for hiring someone. I mean, we've been fortunate in the past four or five years that pretty much steady state chapter ninety funds coming in, which just allows us to do probably a six to seven hundred fifty thousand dollar project each year, paving project. But this extra five hundred was a nice little oomph to it, and some savings from other chapter ninety years. What's the contract? 1.8 million this year? Yeah. Well, that was sort of my question. So, what is the right steady state number? We know where, where I don't know, there's the, 26 million, that's the number I remember, is a 
paving backlog based on some road conditions. A lot more than that. It's almost 40. Okay, well, that's, I assume the number didn't go down or whatever. Well, down a little this year. Well, yeah, a little bit. But, but so, so there you go. So what is the growth in that number? And what does $1.8 million do to that? So say $500,000 a year, maybe it needs to be a million dollars a year plus chapter 90s, which, which I, you said it's been consistent, but um, that's coming from the state, and so who knows? Right, the other thing that we don't know about is that it was proposed that they increase our chapter 90 by 50%. So we're going from 1 million to 1.5, but it seems to get hung up every year and doesn't pass through. But there's people still pushing for that $300 million bill for Chapter 90 funds across the state. Mm. Pay attention to how you vote on the gas tax question. Mm. Well, I ride a bicycle. Can you guess where I'm going to vote? Your pay? Sure. Let them, let them pay. <laughs> Fine with me. I like smooth paving too. <laughs> Especially. Uh, All right. Any other thoughts on that? I don't know. Enough? So I have a question, just a, just a general question. I'm not accustomed to um, once a once a body such as ourselves starts deliberating, such as it is with our uh, agenda, to have voices from the audience weigh in whenever the hell they feel like it bugs me. Uh, is that is that something that you guys have done as a practice? We have. It, it, not, not everyone is um, economical with their thoughts. Mm. You gotta have to put up with it sometimes, but. Uh, there are people who show up and they're well intended and they they really have. Uh, well, I understand when you call for for a, uh, a old business and yeah. and ask for input. Yeah, I mean but Jasper to, has been leading the charge inputs, on this. Yeah, you know, or comments or you know peanut gallery stuff bugs the hell out of me. I mean, I'm just I I, I, yeah. I don't I'm just not used to it. That's right. all. I, I don't know. It's, it seems to me that there's a there should be more respect for the fact that we are what we are. Mm -hmm. And they are the public, and they've got their time at the beginning of a meeting. And uh, anyway, just give it some thought. I'm, I'm just curious what the custom has been. And if I'm g g getting in the way of something that you feel comfortable with, then I'm happy to back off. I just am finding it very unusual. Well, Dick has. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I got to give you credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I you know, but I'm <laughs> still. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. I know, no, I think, I, I think it's a matter of public fine. record. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, what, what is everyone, I'm, I'm I, I like the fact that what we do is when we do the agenda item is we typically hold any comment from the audience until we're done with our conversation and then yeah. we open it up and, and I actually think, you know, that we encourage people to come and hear what we're talking about, that I think it's respectful of the public to offer them the opportunity to comment on it. I don't have any problem with putting some limits on that. Do we ask or do we, or do they just offer? We, usually they raise their hand. Um, Dick is always good to ask, and, and I, occasionally he, he, I mean, he comes up with some decent questions. I, and some decent suggestions. Yeah, and he puts the time in. I mean, he has sat through innumerable yeah. meetings. I just find it's almost cool. moved. It is we're, not. We're, we're, we're going to be advisory all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah. Yeah. Almost, yeah. almost. We'll be ignoring us. Right. right. Uh, I was on the cable advisory committee under Mayor Musanti. And in fact, I was an alternate member. So I was a non voting member <laughs> of a, a powerless <laughs> committee. <laughs> and, and cable vision. <laughs> cable vision just totally ignored us. I mean, they thank us for our input and that's it. But unfortunately, we can't do that. I can take a no better chair for the future of Board of Public Works. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. Oh, thanks. Uh, well, so, I mean, you know, as long as the consensus is that it's okay, I, I'm. No, I understand. That's, that's, that's fine. It's, I'm just not used to it. That's all. I just. I, I think having control zones is good. I think, I think actually it was fairly recent that we put the public comment thing on the agenda, like, you know, the like last two yeah. years, or, yeah. Oh. Um, and then I think also we have specific agenda items that we, it, it is uh, specific for a project, like all the street approvals. Mm -hmm. We would have people come from the street, uh, from, from those yeah. streets. And we did want to hear from them. We asked for their comments. So, yeah. I don't know, I, I think it's, I think we have, um, 
maybe built a reputation that they'd be more open to that than some of the other boards of community. Yeah, that's probably all it is. Yeah. Right? And I think that people are looking for a way to have input into our decision making process. And we don't have the same sort of relationship that city councilors might have with their wards or their districts. The, you know, the, the only yeah. way to really offer that type of comment is to show up here. I mean, we've been very public about what our agendas are, they're out there, and we've invited people to come and they watch us do our work and participate in that. Okay. Yes. Right. Mike says it's probably not going to mean anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's an advisory. Uh. All right. Uh, we, I don't think we have any um, unanticipated topics. Uh, the reuse center, if you have an uh, MJ, do you have? I have nothing to report. Okay. And the Bridge Street Cemetery CPA applications? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to mention about these two CPA grant applications is that the uh, the agenda for the upcoming meetings in October has been set by that committee and um, on Wednesday, October 15th at 7.30 is the Bridge Street Cemetery application will be considered by, uh, by the commission. And on Wednesday, October 29th, 7.05, the Pulaski Park Renovation Grant will be, um, will be presented at that time. So if you're so inclined and interested, that's where most of the meetings will be. Do you think, um, Jim, not that I haven't been, paying, been attentive to what you just said, but could you send out an email the day of the uh, CPA hearing? Sure. Just reminding us that what time the meeting was that night. Yep. Um, I think that concludes our regularly scheduled program. Uh, Gary, is there anything you were hoping we would talk about tonight that we didn't? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have an item. Okay. In the category of full disclosure, um, I live in a subdivision Interior with stormwater uh, retention facilities. And I've been, um, I volunteered to provide engineering services to the subdivision to do inspection of the facilities and I know that uh, one of them needs some repair so I'm going to be going to the Conservation Commission um, to get approval of the repairs and um, I've been talking to Jim and Doug McDonald about some of this so I just just wanted the board to understand that I was meddling around like that and um, if you happen to hear about it you're not the last to hear about it you're the first okay. Advisory? What? My work? No. <laughs> <laughs> what I just said was, yeah. All right, thanks. Yep. EPA has released the new draft MS4 permit. Oh, don't tease us like that. So, um, Doug and I are in the process of reviewing um, the contents of the permit to figure out what the implications are for us. Um, there's a, a meeting in Springfield next Tuesday at, at PVPC with EPA about sort of general overview of the contents of the permit. Um, I'll be at a professional conference um, sitting on a panel next Thursday in Mystic, Connecticut, and EPA will also be there talking about the new draft permit. So um, things are in the works related to um, how that's going to be impacting us in the stormwater side. So I'm fine. Any Good surprises? I haven't read it yet, to be honest with you. Um, the permit's like 100 pages, and the fact sheet's like 150 or something like that, in the typical EPA fashion where the fact sheet, well, no, it's the other way around. Yeah, it's that way. The fact sheet that helps you understand the permit is like <laughs> really long. But anyway, Doug and I are reviewing the details. Have people yeah. actually received their stormwater? No, oh, so it should be the next couple of They're days. mailing, the stormwater bills are mailing out on Friday, so they'll be receiving them Saturday and Tuesday. I and have Tuesday off. Tuesday, the phone says, oh, you can take that day off. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's no one here. Please leave a message. I had it planned. Sorry. Oh, and about your bill, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, they picked them up today. Uh -huh. So, well, that's exciting. You guys have worked really hard getting We're not done yet. But we're getting there. Another month, we'll be done. Okay.
So you divide the city up into six or seven? Six, six sections groups. plus yeah. the seven is the monthly bills for the industrial, yeah. ones that we bill on a monthly basis. So we're on section six. And we're on track to hire the laborers that are going to, I don't know what you call them, probably have a code for it. They're posted. Yep. Yeah. They're all posted. Uh, Nicole sent around a flyer with a forest walk coming up um, for the board members to see. We'll probably do a similar. Did she send that on? No. Didn't see it. I saw it. I don't know who she sent it to. I didn't see it. Oh, I'll forward it to you. It's okay. We'll be getting a flyer from us <laughs> about a forest walk that's upcoming. But we'll also do one for the Red Pine, too, in the areas that we're, we're proposing work. So we'll do sort of a pre cutting um, forest walk with Mike. They're a lot of fun, actually. Mike is a really interesting person, and he's passionate about forestry. So the walks, if you have time, some of the board members have been on, and they're really, they're really informative and interesting. Now, I was in Ireland during the Mad Cow thing, and coming back, I swear to God, there's a guy in customs who washed my shoes. I had to stand there and hold my shoe up, and this guy scrubbed my shoes. So are we going to have any risk of taking those little red pine scales and tracking them all around, people in and out of the forest? Terry, I'll scrub your shoes for you. I just wonder. <laughs> you are going to bring it home? You <laughs> should go barefoot. Okay. Just better. Well, you'll climb into the red pine. I think you're good. Or the poison ivy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just for the creeps. Yeah. MJ? I'm good. I'm good. I told you about my, my day. Motion to adjourn? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone.